My name is Ed Hannenberg, and I hold the Jack and Mary Jane Breen Chair in Catholic Systematic Theology within the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at John Carroll University. I'm so glad to welcome you to add my welcome, and it's uh, to Doris's and, and others here uh, responsible for the conference. It really is my delight this morning to welcome a good friend and an excellent theologian. Our next speaker, Dr. Natalia Imperatori Lee, represents a rising generation of Catholic theologians who are deeply committed to the church and sensitive to its changing global face. So committed, I would say, that she's not afraid to challenge some of the craziness that um, happens within our church and offers, I think, a, a clear eye on uh, so much that's going on uh, theologically, ecclesiologically, socially, culturally. <laughs> Dr. Natalia Imperatori Lee is Associate Professor of Religious Studies at Manhattan College, where she teaches in the areas of contemporary Catholicism, U.S. Latino, Latina theology, and gender studies. She holds a PhD in systematic theology from the University of Notre Dame. Her research area is contemporary ecclesiology, or the vision of the church including the impact of US Latinos, Latinas on the North American ecclesial landscape and feminist theologies. Her publications include several articles in academic journals, including uh, just a sampling of some of the titles uh, of, uh, re reflecting uh, Dr. Imperatore Lee's interests, The Challenge and Promise of Hispanic Marian Devotion, Mother Superior, Mother Inferior, <laughs> Mary in the thought of Hans Urs von Balthasar. Hombres, hembras, hombres. Narration, correction, and the work of ecclesiology. Sin, intimacy, and the genuine face of the church. She is currently working on a book for Orbis Press on the importance of narrative in Catholic ecclesiology. Her topic this morning is the papacy, 2014. Fame, Francis, and the future of the global church. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Natalia Imperatori Lee. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Ed, for that. Is that better? Yes. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Here we go. Thank you, Ed, for that very kind introduction. And thank you, Doris, for the invitation. I felt so welcome here. This is my first trip to Cleveland, and it's so beautiful. Um, <laughs> that wasn't a joke. I really do think it's beautiful. Um, and I feel very welcome at John Carroll. I see a Notre Dame mug. I see a Notre Dame jacket. I see Notre Dame colleagues. I feel like I'm sort of back home in a way. It's kind of cool. So. Go Irish. <laughs> I am delighted to be here this morning to offer my thoughts on this first whirlwind year of Jorge Mario Bergoglio's tenure as the Bishop of Rome. I like the idea of this being the toddlerhood of his papacy, <laughs> having survived toddlerhood twice in my own children. I think this is a fun image as we think about where we are. You know, anything can happen at this point one year in. Not unlike having a one-year-old. Right? They're mobile, they're scary, <laughs> they fall a lot. Nothing good happens. Um, I received the news of his election. I saw the white smoke when I was teaching, ironically, my Vatican II course um, at Manhattan College. I had the podium computer on CNN.com but I wasn't projecting it, it was just sort of there in the corner of my eye and I was, you know, walking around lecturing, doing my thing and all of a sudden I look over and I see the white smoke and, you know, all, everything broke loose in the classroom and I stopped what I was doing and the students were delighted, probably more because I had stopped talking <laughs> than because of the new pope, but nevertheless, everyone was very happy. Later that day, we caught a glimpse of Pope Francis for the first time and I thought, Ooh, a Latin American. I sort of cheered, but at the same time I felt really guarded, right? He's an old Argentinian male. 
<laughs> How good was this going to be? Um, would it be more of the same? Right? It was a genuine concern. I was, I was worried about more of the same. And I was, I think, pretty much wrong on that angle. Right? If nothing else, this year has not been more of the same. Right? My remarks today are structured around three themes. The fandom surrounding Francis. The global church I think Francis is ushering in and what that looks like and the future more humanized church, particularly the issue of women's roles in that future. So first, the fame. I don't know if you know this, but Pope Francis is all over the internet. <laughs> He's all over very weird places on the internet. Um, the weirdest place that I have found him um, was when I was looking up a video for my children. Um, I don't know if you know the song Happy by Pharrell. I hope you know it. I assume that some of you have heard it as well. Um, so the kids want to hear it all the time. And I was looking it up on YouTube. And on the sidebar, I see this man dressed as a pope, who is clearly not the pope. And obviously, I clicked on it. And it was a rapper giving a news report in rap about the papal election, where he says, and you'll forgive me because it's pretty weird, um, that Francis is, quote, straight pimping with his rosary. <laughs> and uh, trying to shape religion to what it's supposed to be. I was like, wow. I guess this is the church that we live in now. right? I guess this is the world that we're living in now. What? How did we get here? In this year, and I think you've seen it um, scrolling on the back here, Francis has been on the cover of countless magazines, including Time, who named Francis the person of the year for 2013, a big splashy spread on the front of Rolling Stone, and perhaps most surprisingly, The Advocate, one of the most prominent gay publications here in the United States. The thought of any pope in recent decades being named the Advocate's person of the year is utterly perplexing, <laughs> if not completely astonishing. And yet, there is something about this pope, isn't there? Maybe it's this pope in contrast to previous popes. Or maybe it is this papacy in this cultural moment that has captured the public imagination not only here in the United States, but around the world. There's been a genuine, palpable resurgence of interest in Roman Catholicism in mainstream circles, nationally and globally. This has been accompanied by, if not an increase or a measurable increase in practicing Catholicism, at the very least, a diminishing of the defeatist resignation to the church's growing irrelevance in the world at large. Curiosity and hopeful expectation have, more than any other sentiments, I think, characterized Francis's first year at the Vatican, replacing the chorus of, oh well, or, well, what did you expect from the church? Which I would hear a lot, especially from students, and I would say, well, this is what the church thinks about, and they'd be like, Oh, well. whatever. Francis has risen to this level of cultural phenomenon. Everything from rap genius, you can tell what kind of music my children like, to the evening news are scrambling to document the Francis effect, whatever the Francis effect turns out to be. It should be noted that the Pope himself disdains this fame, right? Saying recently, a week ago, I think, that the mythology of Pope Francis is something he finds offensive, right? And even something that he says contains a little bit of aggression, as all idealizations do. And I don't think that he's wrong about that. I want to return to the idea of idealization as aggression and violence later on. If we zoom out just a bit historically, having a popular pope isn't groundbreaking to any of us who remember John Paul II, and I assume that we all do. Uh, given the long reigning years of that papacy, though, and the interim papacy of Benedict XVI, who lacked the charisma of his predecessor, and if you add to this the short-term memory that characterizes popular culture, Francis's growing fandom demands headlines of its own. It feels groundbreaking, even if it's not. And it feels like a reprieve, especially in this country, where the Catholic Church hasn't drawn positive headlines in the mass media for quite some time. Moreover, I think there is a major difference between Francis's popularity and the popularity and celebrity of John Paul II. And my hunch, though premature, since 
as uh, Father Hare mentioned, we're only a year in, and it's the toddlerhood of this papacy, that it's not merely the person of Francis that is garnering the attention and the admiration, but the person combined with the message. And by his message, I don't just mean what he's trying to put out there, but the cultural contexts that are on the receiving end of this message as well. John Paul II, who was elected when I was a toddler and dominated my generation's understanding of the church, displayed a great deal of charisma and was undoubtedly a global figure. He broke down barriers in terms of how people saw the Bishop of Rome. I remember the, like, one of the first memories I have of the Pope is the picture of him skiing and how crazy my mother, who was from Cuba, thought that was. Right? Not just because he was skiing at all, but that the Pope should ski. Right? And what would he wear? And it was so crazy. Did you see this picture? <laughs> he traveled everywhere. We saw him in Miami. I saw him in Denver. He expanded the horizons of the papacy beyond this <coughs> European confines in terms of his presence. With the help of the rapidly accelerating role of the media in public life and the ease and accessibility of traveling long distances, John Paul conducted his papacy on a world stage. And he enjoyed much of the celebrity that went along with that global image. It was, in many cases, the first time people experienced the pope as a dominant figure in the church, instead of as the court of last resort. And some crankier ecclesial history types like to recall that 100 years ago, most Catholics didn't even know the pope's name. And many only sort of knew the bishop's name. And now, the roles have clearly reversed. The, pope, the papacy is an office with the sort of news coverage afforded not just a monarch, but a monarch with subjects all over the world. Don't tell Cardinal Dolan, but a lot of my students don't know his name. <laughs> but everybody knows Pope Francis's name now. The celebrity of office, though, is not what I suspect is going on with Francis, though undoubtedly he's very much a celebrity. It's not just his person that gets attention, the, the Francis as a pope, but also the way he is refocusing Catholicism away from the rigid culture war battles that had grown stale in this country, especially among the youth, and toward what is perceived to be a simpler evangelical message of a poor church for the poor. Right? It's easy to say, it's easy to visualize, even if it is not easy to implement. Cardinal Casper noted just a month into Francis's papacy last year that the new pope seemed to be ushering in a second phase of the reception of Vatican II. And theologians like Massimo Fagioli have echoed this, calling Francis the first pope for whom the council is a given and not a contested reality. Certainly, the excitement around Francis can be said, I think, to mirror the excitement around the council, right? The Catholicism's real coming out on a world stage in the modern media. The message of a poor church was, in fact, ushered in by the council and is revivified in Francis. We also see in Francis a humble bishop living in community, seemingly leaving behind the royal trappings of the papacy. The image reinforces the message, though they're not coextensive. Right? I think Francis's message goes beyond whatever ratty shoes he's wearing or the banishing of excessive gold from the papal court. Indeed, rather than a global image, what I think we have in Francis is a global image and message. The church should be for the poor who God loves especially. The gospel should bring joy for it is good news. The church does not exist for itself but on behalf of the world. These are things that the Pope says but we all participate in. We can all buy into it and in that sense the message is global. It feels very appropriate for a world where, as Father Hare reminded us, poverty remains a fundamental reality, and the divide between rich and poor continues to grow even in this country. Here is a pope whose popularity serves to broadcast themes of openness and forgiveness and humility and joy, all the sorts of things that we want associated with the church because they're central to the gospel. So the fame can be good. It interests people and it reaches them, especially the young, the disaffected, those who had fallen away angry, and their numbers are very high. I can't tell you the number of people who come up to me and say, well, this is a pope, a pope that I can support, right? or this isn't the Catholicism that I remember, or this isn't the church that I left. This seems different. Peaking interest, putting out humility and openness, these are the ways in which Francis's popularity work, I think, in concert with the gospel. We shouldn't forget that Jesus drew large crowds, too. 
But there are downsides to this fame. Fame is fickle and shallow and transient. More importantly, fame is not a conduit for nuance. Now that the media is such a force in our world, we seem to prioritize perception over substance. Right? That seems to be a characteristic of the way that we operate in society. And we shouldn't forget that along with a pope who's eager to meet the crowds and who eschews the enclosed car in favor of an encounter with the people, we have a team in charge of public relations who photograph and broadcast this image to the world. So we should be cautious. Image and message are both being crafted, especially in this country, but I think everywhere, to some extent by what is thought to be popular or by what an audience is perceived to want. This is why here in the States, stories about Catholicism tend to feature culture war issues, usually <coughs> sexual ones. Right? Whenever you read about the Catholic Church, it's like, and this is what the Pope said about abortion. Or the Pope didn't say anything about abortion, as if he had sat somewhere and not talked. <laughs> or this is what the Pope didn't say about women, as if he hadn't said you know, 5,000 words on the economy. Right? Because we, that's the sort of package of Catholicism that we like. And stories about him tend to reflect our love for charismatic figures, right? We love heroes here in the United States. We love a hero. I'm just not sure that we need a hero in charge of the church. Another caution, and I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer, I promise this gets happier. Um, public relations and public life, as I said, are not friendly to nuanced positions, and theological positions, because they're reflections on the gospel, grounded in a varied and centuries-long tradition, cannot be reduced to a soundbite. So we hear things like, who am I to judge? And in our infotainment culture, we don't hear it, right? We're hearing it and hearing it and hearing it and hearing it over and over for weeks. We don't hear the context that preceded it, the words that follow it, the tone inflected in it. So it's good for us to be careful that our hope and our excitement, if indeed we have that, aren't filling in the blanks that get left out when a news outlet latches on to a particularly felicitous phrase. There's always more going on. There's always more to it. And it's incumbent on us to ground our excitement in the full picture and not the viral snippet. So to sum up this first point, Francis is not the first celebrity pope. But he's nevertheless a pope who combines image and message in refreshing ways. Rather than a global figure with a Eurocentric, centralized vision of the church as John Paul II had, what Francis projects is a charismatic populist message that is reinforced by his popular style. And it's backed up by policies that seem to give heft to his decentering of the hierarchy, a little bit, and overall horizontalizing and humanizing ecclesial impetus. This impetus comes about through Francis's global identity and his hermeneutic of encounter. And I want to move now to the global identity. So I titled, uh, this is a, a lot of words, but the, this section is entitled Multifaceted Globality. <laughs> The church as polyhedron. I know, right? Weird. <laughs> After the Second Vatican Council, Karl Rahner theorized that church history could be divided into three eras. The era of Jewish Christianity, the era of Hellenistic or Euro-American and Euro-American Christianity, and the world church. The first, Jewish Christianity, lasted for only about the first hundred years. The second lasted up until the Second Vatican Council, and the world church was being ushered in at Vatican II. In many ways, this was true, right? The participation of bishops native to all parts of the globe, or many parts of the globe, not European bishops who had been sent to the mission territories, but people who had been born and raised in different cultures, their participation at the council signaled a new thing, new voices, and also the level of participation, right? Thousands of bishops instead of hundreds of bishops also signaled that there was something different going on in 1962 to 1965. But historical eras, as we know, are notoriously fuzzy. It's not like we can say that one Catholicism ended in 1965 and then a new Catholicism started in 1966. If we take Fajoli's insight that for Francis, the council is not a contested reality but a given, we might look at this papacy as ushering in a new phase of the world church. Perhaps 
the way we think of it here in the States, right? There was the election, and then some months later, there's the inauguration. Maybe this is the inauguration of the World Church, and that there were 50 years in between is something that is how the church moves, right? Not that quickly, but nevertheless, it moves. The global reality Francis is bringing about may not even be intentional. It might be a product of his own identity as a citizen of the global south and as a child of immigrants. And his parents immigrated to Argentina from Italy. As a bicultural person, and all immigrants and their children, and sometimes also their grandchildren, tend to be bicultural, Francis would be accustomed to moving between cultures while retaining some sort of identity. And this, I believe, is a crucial building block of the world church. So let's start small with Francis's Argentinian nationality. There have been several times in this papacy where Pope Francis has said something and I said, boy, that sounds like something, someone from Argentina. I see it in two small ways and one very significant one. The small ones are his focus on the destructive power of gossip and the highlighting of the importance to not discard the elderly. In each of these, I hear an echo of Latin American culture. Now, these ideas aren't, of course, exclusive to one culture, but I, it's what I hear when I hear it. The theme of public reputation, right, which in Latin American literature is known as the que dirán, the what will they say, is a constant theme in the literature of the Spanish-speaking Caribbean and also of, of Latin America at large. Cultures tend to be reputation-driven. And the power of gossip to destroy a person or a family, it might seem like a strange thing to be returning to, right? Why does he keep talking about gossip? What a strange thing for the Pope to say. And yet, when you think about Argentinian history and its dirty war and its government disappearing people based on their rumors of their complicity with communism, you see that the focus on gossip doesn't really come from nowhere, right? And it's not really trivial. Gossip was something that the Pope saw debilitating families and ruining lives and really sort of decimating his country. A second emphasis I hear from Francis that I don't hear as often in the past is the key role of the elderly, as Father Hare brought up, and the need to move away from a view that discards old people. This is a broadening of life issues you know, with an emphasis on something that we hadn't heard before. It was always there, but it's a new emphasis. Certainly, the, the idea of Latin American families as metanuclear, right? The notion of the family as extending beyond and the household including not just parents but grandparents and aunts and uncles, I think is something that is operative um, in this notion of the elderly, of keeping the elderly around and not discarding them. Certainly his theological emphasis on poverty has to have something to do with his citizenship in what used to be called the developing world. But there are also ecclesiological points that I think indicate the coincidence or the coinciding of Francis's cultural identity and the eruption of the world church. If indeed the world church begins at Vatican II and replaces the Hellenistic Euro-American church that preceded it, a child of immigrants from the global south might be the person to bring it about. Why? In this recent interview where he talked about, um, whatever it was that I just mentioned in the beginning, Pope Francis was asked his opinion of globalization. And his words were very telling, I think. He said, while economic globalization aims for a smooth sphere where each is equidistant from the center, the church envisions globalization as a polyhedron. You know what a polyhedron is? Right? Um, when I, I always think of Epcot Center I'm from Florida. Um, that Epcot, the big ball, is a polyhedron, right? But it can actually be asymmetrical. And I, when, when I think of it, I like to think of it as asymmetrical and really weirdly shaped, but a faceted whole. Right. So the church envisions globalization as a polyhedron, where cultures and peoples maintain their identity in language and religion and are not all reduced to sameness. He was talking about economic globalization, but I think that this is a really powerful image for the church moving forward. Right? The church is a polyhedron. It's a groundbreaking, or it could be, a groundbreaking vision of the global church, and one, I think, that has much in common with the vision of Vatican II. In many ways, the comment bears the marks of someone who was, who's from what was formerly known as the developing world, right? who were the objects of globalization, the people globalization was supposed to help. 
With economic uplift for some came cultural erasure for many others. Globalization in the economic sense has not turned out as well as promised for everyone, but the church is also envisioned as a global reality. That the global church need not be uniform or smooth in order to be unified or one is definitely sounding a different note than the one we had been hearing in the past. This is decidedly different, for example, from the smaller, purer church that we heard echoed in the papacy of Benedict XVI. This global polyhedron image is what I think Francis's global church might look like. When I think about Rahner's idea of a world church emerging from Vatican II, that's the kind of globe I want to envision. Right? Not a smooth one where unity is a reduction to sameness, but one where genuine diversity is prized and where cultures get to maintain their language and their identity. We all know that every culture where the church exists has idiosync idiosyncratic appropriations and expressions of Catholicism, right? Mass in, well, mass in Miami is different from mass here in Cleveland, is different from mass in South Bend, is different from mass in Chelsea in New York, right? And that is just here in the United States. Now let's think about mass in Honduras. So we all know that these, this cultural flavor exists, but sometimes, it's difficult to see that on the church writ large. One moment where this reality came into relief for me happened a few months ago when um, Cardinal Oscar Rodriguez Maradiaga of Honduras um, replied or was talking about the CDF under Mueller and he said it was too Germanic. And that cracked me up mostly because I've heard a lot of Latin American and Latino theologians talk about the Germanic church. Right, and it's like really derisive tone. And basically they mean, you know, being uptight. <laughs> and it's, that's just too Germanic, right? Or too Nordic, right? Meaning completely foreign, weird, and definitely rule bound in a way that makes us very uncomfortable, right? And so, you know, when Maradiaga says the word too Germanic, I was like, I think here in the United States, we can tend to have this kind of semi-rigid, Germanic idea of what the church is. Let me give you an example. I teach in New York City. And the majority of my students who still identify as Catholic, which is a decreasing number, but nevertheless, the ones who still identify, even culturally, come from Irish or Italian backgrounds. The Irish Catholicism is particularly persistent. And I think it's my favorite example of a cultural Catholicism that gets confused for just Catholicism. Right, or objective Catholicism. <coughs> my students who identify with this sort of religiosity, and I make everyone, when I teach Latino theology, I make everyone do this sort of cultural analysis of themselves, and how do you experience Catholicism, and where do you see the church happening, and stuff like that. And the Irish kids tend to have the same ideas. Right? The church is a rule-bound phenomenon right? with obligations. Right? You're obliged to go to church on Sunday, and to go to confession, and to abstain from meat during Fridays in Lent. For them, this is what it means to be Catholic, these markers. And indeed, if you read the stories of, Amer well, some stories of American Catholicism, you get the sense that Catholicism began in the US in the Northeast and spread South and West. <laughs> Why does that always get a laugh? <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> so the Latin American cultures where Catholicism and Spanish imperialism functioned as one colonial force, have a very different relationship to the church. At once, it's closer, right? It's ingrained in the cultural mitochondria, but it's also highly suspicious, right? If the church and the government are working together and the government is repressive, you're not really signing on 100% to the church either, right? There's a hearty anti-clerical streak in Latin American and Latino Catholicism that I don't even think gets play in the US media. Right? I think Hispanic Catholics especially are often portrayed as this sort of compliant, observant, um, pious group, leaving out this very real suspicion. This blend of this colonial blend of Iberian Baroque Catholicism and indigenous and slave cultures colonized the American West and Southwest with a Catholicism that is quite different, though no less American than the kind in the Northeast, right? Or the kind that predominates in the news. 
the historical relationship to colonization breeds, I think, a different approach within Catholicism, but not one that's less authentically Catholic. Right? It is not a wrong Catholicism or a lesser Catholicism. It is a different Catholicism, a different facet on the polyhedron. Think of how often this pope has spoken out against clericalism and the ways in which his own persona projects this humble, anti-clericalist attitude. Maybe even more than the emphasis on gossip and family, that projects to me the kind of Latin American Catholicism with which I'm most familiar. Right? And it's through this allergy to clericalism that I think Pope Francis is projecting his most Latin American Catholicism onto a church that he hopes to decentralize and to make more global in outlook, style, and ecclesiology. An important reminder, the global reality of the church means that the majority of Catholics are not operating in a Euro-American context or culture, though we here in the States are. Thus, it's very likely that we will experience this globalization as a decentering and destabling exercise. And our vision of the church might cease to be the dominant one. Right? This is the risk of being part of a global church. Francis's globalization aims to decenter the church bureaucratically, I think, and horizontalize the hierarchy, even a bit, by sharing power and by including more non-European voices. So we see this in his appointment of the group of eight cardinal advisors from outside the Curia. We see this in the first 19 cardinals he created, featuring men from Haiti and Burkina Faso. Nine of the 19 are non-European. His disdain for clericalism is evident. He clearly doesn't want his office to be any more exceptional than necessary. We see this every time he says that he's just the Bishop of Rome. He advised the new cardinals that their red berettas did not signify a promotion. <laughs> now, why would you say that unless you thought somebody needed to hear it? <laughs> he seems to disdain careerism of every sort. He emphasizes things that other popes did not. He does not talk as much about secularism and relativism. We don't hear a lot of the culture of life and the culture of death. Instead, he talks about the danger of gossip, the perils of a clerical culture turned in on itself. Maybe Francis's greatest gift to our church could be to serve as a reminder of the genuinely varied ways in which we can be fully, authentically Catholic. Unity without uniformity. A polyhedron and not a sphere. The great thing about a polyhedron, and again, I'm working hard not to think of Epcot Center, but one that's really weird and faceted strangely, is that no one gets subsumed. Right? Genuine diversity blossoms in each of the facets, and unity exists because the facets meet to make a whole. It's an anti-colonial image. Where the original discovery of the Americas wanted to make everyone into European Christians, the polyhedron image conforms more to the idea of 1492 as the year of an encounter between cultures, not the discovery of a new world. So now I want to move to talk a little bit about encounter. The notion of encounter and the humanizing power of face-to-face -face encounters is the third part of my remarks today. Along with a globality that is not uniformity, Francis's ecclesial vision seems to concentrate on humanizing the church. In this too, I see echoes of the Second Vatican Council, right, that urged that the face of the church should be resplendent with the face of Christ. Francis works toward fulfilling this vision of the church through what I believe is a hermeneutic of encounter. And he talks a little bit about cultures of encounter. If previous papacies were characterized by anti-relativism or languages about the culture of life or death, then this pontificate might be a culture of a face-to-face -face encounter. We see this in small ways, right? the, the preference for the open Jeep instead of the enclosed Pope mobile, the literal embracing of people, hello, right? um, it's children, sick pilgrims. There's a picture of him hugging someone every day on my Twitter account. Every morning I wake up and RNS has another picture of the Pope giving someone a hug. He has dinners and interviews and phone calls and sit downs with everyone from Jews to widows to atheists to children. He humanizes the church because of his disarming nature and his manner of interaction. In that interview, Francis talks about this widow he has befriended. And this is my translation from the Spanish text. Um, I called her because her son had died. And now I give her a little call once a month. And the phrase he uses in Spanish is, le pego una llamadita. In other words, I, it literally is like I stick a little call on her. I, I give her a little jingle 
right? It's so informal, right? Something you would say about your, your elderly mom. Oh, I, I try to give her a call once a week, right? I pop in on her, I check. And he said that he likes it because she's happy and he gets to play the priest. <laughs> That's a person, right? He's, a, he's such a person. His warmth and accessibility in the small moments point to the intimacy he's fostering with individuals, with the people in the plaza, with the people who write to him and he writes back. In those small ways, he makes the office of the pope more human and thereby he humanizes the whole church. This humility, right? I am a normal person, he has to keep saying. I am a normal person. I eat, I sleep well, I have friends. That some of those friends are people with whom he has significant differences models the sort of culture of encounter envisioned, I think, by the council. When in Gaudium et Spes, it says that nothing that is genuinely human fails to find an echo in the hearts of Christians, right? We're called as a church to have genuine face-to-face -face encounters with the other. Large gestures also exemplify Francis's culture of encounter, right? So the Pope at the feet of a young incarcerated Muslim woman last Holy Thursday, right? <coughs> Washing and kissing her feet. It's difficult to imagine someone more different than the Pope in age, in gender, in religious identity, in state of life. And there he was, right? Tenderly performing this act, right? It was beautiful, it was humbling to see the pontiff's face at the feet of a woman so different from him. What more could we ask of the church? Does that, that humble act of service embody the face of Christ in the world? I think he believes that we do the most good by meeting people where they are and not by retreating into our own enclaves. But it goes beyond these words and gestures which some might reductionistically characterize as merely symbolic. This is an echo I'm hearing a lot in the media. His approach to the Vatican finances represents another kind of humanizing the church in that the reforms he demonstrates his belief that the bank is a human institution, prone to the sort of behavior which, if not sinful, at least requires oversight. It would seem that along with an allergy to the myth of the Pope, Francis disdains ecclesiological monophysitism that would have us believe that the divinity of the church overshadows the human frailty that composes it. This is as dangerous a heresy as a Christological variety, for it blinds us to the reality of sin within the church, and we have too many examples of that to name. When I speak of Francis humanizing the church, then I don't just mean putting a friendly face on it, right? It's not just the church smiling. It's also recognizing the human failings and the human frailty that have always coexisted within it. So he's making us see the church as more globalized and more decentered, as well as more human. And this is a message in which we can all participate. Make your ego smaller so that Jesus' presence might be magnified. It is precisely in this he must increase and I must decrease mentality that I think he's been Francis has been most successful. But not everything is gloriously refreshing about this pope. Womp womp. Many of my own reasons for worry are rooted in the same Latin American cultural context that gives rise to so much, so much that's so refreshing about him. And here I'm speaking specifically of his views on women. It seems from the things that he has said about the importance of women that we can say three things. Pope Francis wants women to be more involved in the church, possibly even in decision-making roles. Pope Francis, like his predecessors, practices some sort of devotion to the Virgin Mary. This is not unusual. It would be more unusual if a Latin American priest did not have a devotion to the Virgin Mary. And thirdly, Pope Francis speaks about women in idealized ways that I think are informed by a type of Marianismo, right, a Marianism, that is common in Latin America and detrimental to both men and women. Because I'm running out of time, I want to just talk about the third point, right? the dangers of Marianismo, particularly as it combines with the nuptial metaphor for the church, right? the idea of the church as Christ's bride. The term Marianismo, and it's just Marianism with an O at the end, so you can impress people at parties now, <laughs> was coined by sociologist Evelyn Stevens in a 1973 essay exploring what she deemed the other face of machismo in Latin America. Right? We all know what machismo is, right? Macho man and stuff like that. This, this stereotypical view of the Latin American man is aggressive sexually and physically and just all around unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> She, so uh, Professor Stevens wrote, quote, Latin American mestizo cultures, and they're all mestizo to some extent, from the Rio Grande to the Tierra del Fuego, right? So some, on the very, very top, 
all the way to the very, very bottom of Chile, exhibit a well-defined pattern of beliefs and behavior centered on acceptance of a stereotype of the ideal woman. And this is what is in the stereotype. It is ubiquitous in every social class, and it predicates a kind of semi-divinity, a moral superiority, and a spiritual strength of women, characterized by an infinite capacity for abnegation, humility, and sacrifice, bottomless patience toward and submission to the demands of men, and cruelty to younger women while remaining complacent to older women as stand-ins of some sort of vestigial feminine goddess. The phenomenon of Marianismo serves to elevate women in some sense, positing their spiritual greatness and importance, while at the same time infantilizing men for their irreformable intemperance and obstinacy and giving these unalterable imperfections a pass. Women are expected to conform to the Marianista ideal of premarital virginity and postmarital frigidity. And are, <laughs> oh no, this is true. <laughs> It's the ideal. And are bound to these scripted morning rituals, right? A morning with a U, not morning in the AM, right? that dominate the latter half of their lives with required sadness and abstention from any sort of outward appearance of joy or joyful activity. If you've ever been um, to mass in Latin America or to a Hispanic parish here in the United States, you'll notice that there's always like a trio of very old women all dressed in black in the front, usually wearing veils, right? They are doing the appropriate thing. Right? They are doing outward mourning. Right? This is common in other cultures too. The Italians do this too. So the ideal woman in Latin America lives her life as we have constructed Mary's life. Right? From virginity through long suffering right into the Mater Dolorosa. <laughs> she accrues this semi-divine status, right? the average woman, but to maintain it, she cannot involve herself in the outside world too much because it's contaminating. Pope Francis has not said that women should strive to be more Marianista in this specific way. But when he's asked about women and women's roles, he tends to bring up the idea of women's supreme importance, claiming, for example, that Mary was more important than the apostles when he's queried about women's ordination. <clears throat> he has called for a deeper theology of women, echoing John Paul II's emphasis on women's special nature. Right? There's no theology of men. And it doesn't need deepening. Why not? <laughs> in Latin America, the tendency to venerate Mary as the perfect woman and mother functions to the great detriment of all other women who are barred from attaining the impossible Marian ideal of virgin motherhood, but held to an understanding of a virtuous female life as one marked by virginity, reluctance in sexuality, and then sorrowful mourning. The higher women are placed in virtue as moral authorities, as long-suffering mothers, as those who pray and repent for the sins of their husbands and fathers and sons, the more leeway is granted to men to not bother to reform their more animalistic, <laughs> simple natures. See? Everybody loses. It never works out for women to be put on a pedestal. It is the sort of thing that might feel nice in the second, but really, it's to the great detriment of women and men. Now, when we hear Francis claiming that women have important roles to play that are special or different, or that women in the church must be valued, not clericalized, I hear echoes of Marianismo, women's spiritual superiority, and the danger of sullying this with the demeaning affairs of men. Right? In this case, the messiness of running the church. The pedestalizing of women as more important than men and the insistence on the femininity of the church are troubling signs for me that women are poised for little more than symbolic gains directly from this pope. I say directly because there's only so much the pope can do to change the fate of women in the church. Right? This is something that we all, the church, has to collaborate on. It's not something that the pope can sign off on tomorrow. That wouldn't work. And with the enthusiasm gap that Francis seems to be stoking, though, he can do much in terms of tone and attitude. And while his attitude seems to be one of openness, the notes that he is intoning in terms of female participation sadly echo tired stereotypes that don't do much to advance the cause of women's equal humanity or women's full baptismal dignity, which is odd 
given that he admitted, as I mentioned earlier, that all idealization has some aggression, or maybe we can call it violence in it. When Francis speaks, as he did recently, about the capillary function of women, I heard it again. Women are especially important, to be sure, but aren't we all, clergy and lay alike, called to bring the lifeblood of the gospel to the periphery, as he said in The Joy of the Gospel? Why are we differentiating between vessels and gendering them? Capillaries are expendable and they regenerate quickly. Surely this is not what the Pope meant. <laughs> when Francis talks about the femininity of the church, we, I hear the nuptial metaphor, right? And we should, this idea of the church as the bride of Christ, right? Which functions, that metaphor, precisely because of the inequality of the bridegroom and the bride. <coughs> Christ and the church are not equal. And that is why Christ is the bridegroom and the church is the bride. But marriage doesn't look like that anymore, I hope. Now, spouses are equal in dignity. So maybe it's time to leave that image in the past or at least to reformulate it in a way that mirrors the reality of the relationship between Christ and the church, which is unequal, versus the reality of marriage, which is not or should not be. Critical into, to my excursus into Marianismo is to understand the full picture. That is, this is a cultural phenomenon that is largely perpetuated by women right, who impart these values to children. And it's not to be laid at the feet of male chauvinists. Right? This is true of patriarchy generally. Right? Men are not the people who are replicating the patriarchy. Everyone is replicating the patriarchy. Um, I took my children to see Mr. Peabody and Sherman. Anybody see that? It's good. And there's a scene where it's all historical figures and George Washington pulls out a, a $1 bill like to impress the ladies. And then Ben Franklin comes along and pulls out a $100 bill and all the ladies go running over to him. Great. <laughs> what does that teach you about women, boys? Right? This sexist culture isn't gonna replicate itself, right? It takes a lot of cooperation, in this case from DreamWorks. So it's not the fault of male chauvinists, and it's not the fault of Latin American male chauvinists, although there certainly are Latin American male chauvinists. It must be said, too, that this Marianista culture is not demonstrably more unjust than other patriarchal systems. So I don't want us to sit here and be like, oh, those poor Latin American women. Right? That's not the case. The wealthy women, especially, tend to have more leeway within the home and outside of it, um, in the workplace especially, because of the higher availability of cheap labor for child rearing, which is something we should talk about, too. Even in Francis's native Argentina, it has a female president, right? Something that the United States can't seem to do. So my goal is not to say that the Pope suffers from an especially damaging view of women. That's probably not the case at all. But his tendency to put women on a pedestal, to compare them to Mary, and to seek to protect them from the contamination of clericalism or some other ill that's best left to the men, has a name in Latin America. Where then does the hope lie? I think that the way forward, and what gives me hope, even though I wasn't asked to give that lecture, but I'm going to say it anyway, is precisely Francis's culture of encounter, right? the polyhedron. If he can sit down with people who are so different, and if he can share meals, then it's not out of the question to believe that in time, women might be asked to the table. The culture of encounter breeds friendship, and friendship breaks down barriers. Right? And I don't mean to sound naive, like, oh, we can all just be friends. No, this is an idea that Gustavo Gutierrez puts forth about the poor, and that Elizondo puts forth about the way of doing theology. Right? Friendship with the poor teaches you what you need to know. And often, friendship reveals that the group that we have considered other, be it the poor, or the LGBT community, or women, are neither more nor less virtuous than we are, and are as nuanced and complex in their humanity as we. In the culture of encounter, we can hope that Pope Francis might encounter some women theologians. There are lots of us. <laughs> some of whom are women religious. Some of whom are lay women. Some of whom are married. Some of whom are mothers. Others of whom are not. It is only when women are recognized as fully human and not as a special kind of human or humanity with an asterisk that our full baptismal dignity can flourish in the church. So to conclude, Pope Francis's election and his first year in office have restored many people's faith in the Holy Spirit, including my own. 
His affable and humble affect work against the impulse to make him a global celebrity. He tirelessly works to shift the attention away from the person of the Pope and toward the gospel and its message, especially for the poor. Though, through his vision of a globalization that fosters unity and not uniformity, Francis is working to decenter the church, to curtail curial power, and to reflect as the council wanted the face of Christ to the world at large. The work is not finished, but the Pope is not Superman. So my hope is that we have the resolve to take up the work of encountering the other, of befriending the stranger, and of becoming good news to the poor. Thank you. children? My children are eight and four. Eight and four. Weren't you wondering? <laughs> Thank you so much for an entirely different angle on Pope Francis.